obviously make it the same.
No better than anyone else.
Two championship ranks, seven consecutive thousand yard seasons. You're Brian Holt? Zero net perfect payment history. Of course you'll be there. You do. It's all the experience, more money to It has a digital checking account that can build credit without the debt. Please, my perfect. Me too. No way. Oh, 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 man. I'll see you, man. Bye. The debit card that builds credit. Get your experience, smart money account for the free app. Let me try. Guys, I hate to say it, but I'm for help. Welcome, Hidden One.
Three centuries ago, the British black ships of faith and our nation began to tear itself apart. Those who cleave to the past, those who can break the moment, and the longing, warrior free of all blasters and bolts.
Considering that the video game industry is now over 50 years old, if you count pop as the point where it started, then it's really not surprising that it's given us gamers plenty of big moments that have stuck in our collective memories. But have you ever sat down to wonder which ones are the most iconic? We certainly have, and it's for this reason that we've decided to bring you today's big list. To help us pull this list together, we went out amongst our wonderful community with a simple question. What are, in your opinion, the most unforgettable moments in gaming history? Well, you turned out in droves to give your thoughts, so many in fact, that our original plan to list the 101 most unforgettable moments both real world and in game has been thrown out of the window. And we decided instead to create two separate lists, starting with the most iconic in-game moments. Every entry on this list is something that's happened in one of our favourite games that has stuck with us long after the credits have rolled. They can be as small as a single quote, or as big as the death of a beloved character, but what matters is that they've stayed on our minds and in our hearts for the years since their respective games release. As is always the case with these big lists, we must establish some rules. First off, we want to make it very clear that, as with the case with our 101 video games that everyone should play at least once list, these entries are in no particular order. What that means in practice is that the entry in the number one spot is no more or less meaningful than the entry in the number 101 spot. Secondly, in order to prevent repetition, and to ensure that we've got as diverse view of the whole of gaming history as possible, we've decided to limit proceedings to one entry per game. Where you guys suggested multiple options for the same title, we've gone with our gut and picked the moments that we think stand out the most. Finally, a massive spoiler warning is in effect from here on out. As of the very nature of this list, this is unavoidable as we will be covering major plot points, twists, and character deaths. You know, the unforgettable moments. With all that hopefully nice and clear, I'm Ben, I'm Peter, and I'm Ashton from Tiffelka, and here are the 101 most unforgettable moments in gaming history. Number 101 The Identity of Darth Revan. Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. These days, the twist at the end of Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic is probably one of the worst kept secrets in gaming. It is the video games what Bruce Willis was dead the whole time it is to movies, but that doesn't stop it from being completely iconic. Released in 2003 exclusively for PC and Xbox, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic tells the story of the player character's fight to defeat the Sith Lord, Darth Malak. Said some 4,000 years before the rise of the Galactic Empire, KOTOR takes place in the time shortly after the Mandalorian Wars. At the behest of Jedi Knights Revan and Malak, the Jedi become involved in the war and the Republic emerges victorious. Revan and Malak then disappear for a year before returning as Sith Lord and Apprentice respectively and invading the Republic themselves. After Revan seemingly killed by the Jedi, Malak succeeds as former master and begins his own campaign of terror. The game opens with the player character awakening aboard a Republic ship which is under attack from Malak's forces. After crashing on the surface of Terra, the player embarks on a quest to find a Jedi and acquire more information about the Star Forge, the source of Malak's military resources. After journeying to a number of planets, the player is ultimately captured by Darth Malak, who reveals that, shock horror, the player is an amnesiac Darth Revan. In Darth Revan's screams painting, the literal reactions from players truly twist. Number 100, Waiting for Pagan Min, Far Cry 4. This one's a bit of a strange entry to tell you the truth, as not everyone who played Far Cry 4 will have gotten to experience it. Those who have though will know exactly why we've decided to put it on our list. This particular moment happens right at the beginning of Far Cry 4's runtime. Players take control of RJ Darle, a man who travels to the fictional country of Kiryat in order to unite his mother's ashes with his sister's shrine. Unfortunately for him, his bus is attacked by the royal army and RJ and his tour guide are kidnapped by Pagan Min, the king of Kiryat and antagonist of the game. Should RJ flee Min's mansion while his tour guide is being interrogated and the game proceeds as planned? RJ will become embroiled in the civil war that has broken out in the country and will ultimately learn of his family's history. However, if he waits patiently as instructed by Min, Pagan will return to the table, thank RJ for being a gentleman, and then leave him to his sister's shrine to place his mother's ashes. After that, he invites RJ to join him to finally shoot some goddamn guns, and then that's it, the game ends. This moment completely caught players off guard when the game was released, as it was a complete subversion of expectations. Usually, the game would refuse to move forward, or would see the player character killed for not doing what it wanted them to. 
In this instance, Spark Rifle rewarded those who followed Rin's instructions with a neat little instructive that has to be the most brilliant in gaming history. Number 99, the first liquor in Resident Evil 2. The Resident Evil series is full to... if you couldn't tell, where we want to talk about some games we don't get to mention very often. Here are some mostly big games that didn't get enough attention, or we suspect some people just skip. Let's talk about some games. We got 10, which is a little bit better about number 10. Star Wars Squadrons does not come up in the conversation of modern Star Wars games. Obviously, there's been some good ones lately. Yeah, we had that misstep with that one too, but that would be a much better game, and of course, the respawn led Star Wars Jedi games are kicking ass, but Star Wars Squadrons is often forgotten. This is the aerial combat dogfighting game that a lot of old school Star Wars fans have been running for a long time. This is completely X-Wing versus TIE Fighter, but in the modern age. And that is, for a lot of Star Wars fans, just look at Dr. Horn. This game killed the boy that was empty for many, many years, which is the X-Wing combat. In this, maybe it didn't get a ton of attention because it was mostly the first game, like the but it's still sense of control, satisfaction, and all that. And just the big Star Wars-ness of it all, it's really, really succeeded. They totally nailed it. It had a VR mode where you could wait and it really felt like you were in high fighter cockpits, X-Wing cockpits, and there was a full flushed out campaign. The campaign wasn't super long, but it had some interesting ideas to it, some cool cameos, and good combat scenarios. And then there was online multiplayer. It was pretty much everything. The full package, and at least it was in your full price game. I'm not like shilling for it or anything, but I just wish more people checked this one out. This is by EA Motive, believe it or not, who went on to work on the very good Dead Space remake, of course, but Star Wars Squadrons is still worth visiting if you never checked it out or if you're rogue enough. Next up, we're at number nine. Let's talk about the modern content scene for Blue Time Games. Now, I've been playing since the original first week, huh? so I'm a little bit of a stickler. I don't know if I absolutely love this stuff. We do want to point out that even though Ghost Recon Breakpoint and Ghost Recon Wildlands didn't necessarily do it super well, they went on to be community. It seems like a lot of people are having fun with them to this day. But Wildlands, really, it wasn't a game you should have played secretly because it took a while for it to get updated. A lot of people really loved it for a lot of experience. And then alongside with that, Ghost Recon Breakpoint, which in my opinion had more problems, ended up being replaced by a small English community that really just ran with pods and play and having a lot of fun. GameSpot did a really, really good video on that if you want to check it out. Just search GameSpot and go straight from Breakpoint. So even though I don't have a personal investment in this one, really, I do personally have a lot of people that do and end up having a lot more fun than me. So I think that's worth highlighting. A lot of games have very unconventional life cycles where they get picked up by a community later on, or become a better game with mods and updates, and these Ghost Recon games are prime examples of that. Do they stand up completely to the old Ghost Recon games? That I don't know about, but still worth considering. Next up, we're at number eight, we have Kimo Bridge of Spirits. Now, when this released back in September 2021, we don't think it got enough attention. It got good reviews, people seem to genuinely like it, but it didn't really come up in Game of the Year conversation. It really wasn't held on to very tightly by the third person action adventure platformer crowd. But these types of games, now in this day and age, only come around ever so often. And 
Team of Virgil Spirits was solid, good fun. If it was the fact that on the surface it looked a little generic, what you have here is a game that's absolutely gorgeous with a charming world, some fun puzzles, and some challenging combat. Actually, surprisingly challenging. Some of the bosses towards the end got pretty nuts. For a game that looks like it's made for kids, it, it was pretty challenging. But I will say that art, style, character and ability are all the most charming, Pixar like quality. And it's a shame we haven't seen a sequel, at least not yet. But there's room to really improve on this formula and make it even better game and build on this world even more. Like I said, it reviewed well, it received pretty well, according to the leadership from the developers about Sony was happy with the sound presents, but you just don't hear too much about it anymore. I mean, game ranks is going to be about it. Oh, we review the game and I moved on. Some games just don't have that romantic impact in the conversation. Still, really the sound and the game of the experience. Next, our board number seven, we have Immortals Phoenix Rising. This released at the end of 2020, like in December. And it was a flurry of big games that was picking up the headlines. And unfortunately, with that, it seems like Immortals Phoenix Rising got to the big song. It's after it released, the movie saw kind of a lot of interest in it. And there was at least early phases of development of a sequel, but that has since apparently been cancelled. And that's a shame because Immortals Phoenix Rising was a special, fun, simple game. It was kind of like the counterpoint to a lot of other Ubisoft games at the time that had giant maps, endless quests, and icons that you could play forever, where Immortals Phoenix Rising was kind of a little bit more quality over quantity. It still had a big world with little things to do, but the way it played out, the way it all it's just really fun and satisfying. And it was a cartoony, kind of lighthearted spin on Greek mythology. Something that we've seen in so many games before, but here, it feels a little bit more cartoony and fun, and not hyper-realistic or gritty or gruesome. It kind of felt like The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild mixed with one of the modern Assassin's Creed games, like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and it turns out that was actually a pretty cool combination. It had a lot of good environmental and situational puzzles. Some of them were, you know, were pretty brain busting. Also, some good combat and some big boss battles. It wasn't perfect, sure, but it was still really fun to play through. So, if you're looking for something open the world but not extremely massive, and also something a little bit more lighthearted and fun and cheery, consider this one. Next up, we're number six. We have Call of Juarez Gunslinger. Now, this game is incredibly underrated because it comes from a franchise that nobody really cared about. There's been a couple of Call of Juarez games, and they were fine, whatever, shooters. But Gunslinger turned out to be just like a super tight, satisfying, arcade-style first-person shooter. That really embraces the West in a way we haven't seen in other video games. If that doesn't sound interesting enough to you, uh, let me at least pitch you this. It was developed by Techland, the people behind the Dying Light game, so just think good first-person action with some gore and a little bit of edge to it, and there you go. That's Call of War's Gunsling. It has like a legendary, overwhelmingly positive on speed because it's just good, simple, straightforward video game. If you're looking for a cool first-person single-player action game, Call of War is Gunslinger is it. And next over at number five, we have A Way Out. This is from the developer James Light Studios, the people most recently behind It Takes Two. But this was their previous game, the one in between It Takes Two and Brothers of Tale of Two Sons, and it once again embraces cooperative play. And it does it in such a special way. Or really, multiple special games. So, what this is, is essentially a buddy kind of heist, jail, breakout type of it, it encompasses a lot, where each character is playing as one of the two dudes. And what starts as a prison break game, there's with complex scenarios, like you're both trying to shimmy out, hiding stuff in your jail cells, keeping watch and look out for guards. Eventually, you break out, you're on police chases together, you're getting in shootouts together, and this paced incredibly well. You're not just running and gunning for a whole game. You're doing all types of different things. You're getting to know these characters not only through dialogue and story, but also through you and your friend experiencing this together. The game designs so many components to really get you strategizing with your partner, maybe even yelling at them, and generally just having a really good time. 
like I said, you're always doing something different in this game. There's tons of new games. It tells a pretty interesting and compelling story with an ending that is absolutely worth experiencing, especially if you played through this one entirely on the couch with one of your closest friends. It can be that special. I've been singing the praises of this game for years. We did do a day ranks before you buy on it, but we haven't really talked about it too much other than that one video, but here I'm saying it today. A way out, it's from 2018, but if you're looking for a really good follow-up experience, check it out. Next up for number four, we have Astral Chain. Astral Chain, released in 2019, seems cool. I think when people talk about the best Switch games, there are so many things worth mentioning, but you know, even in the conversation, you never hear a whiff about Astral Chain. Now this is a Platinum Games game, and it was a Switch exclusive, and the lead designer is behind the Automata, who was super bad by it, of course, could get looked for me. He, of course, was the legendary designer behind so many things, but most of all, something like Yellow Man Pride. In this game, it's cool, stylish, fast movement, over-the-top combos, button mashing, action combat, but you're also playing as this, like, sci-fi rookie police officer, and they're a crime fighting and mystery side. Really, this is a simple one to explain. Like, you know, both good creatures, make fun, and you know, this is a little bit of an action adventure. So, okay. And now, number three, we're going back. This is one of the first ones that at least really, really understands the anime adventure. Specifically, the third of the first one, the slower things, the scary, the simple. Ellie isolated the first person. We're bringing up specifically Now down to number two, we have Angel's Seven Days to Die. For some people, this is like a no-brainer, but in our networks, in our gaming community, the gaming news world, the Seven Days to Die doesn't really come up a lot. It's actually pretty cool. It's kind of hard to explain, but it's essentially like a This is a game that released in 2013 and has been living for a long time in early access. You're killing, you're shooting, you're crafting, you're building, you're playing with and against others, and you can spend hours and hours and hours in this one. Really cool zombie design, and fun combat. Seven Days to Die is more of like a sandbox game, but it is fun. If you're into PC games, Seven Days to Die seems like it's still going to happen. Now down to number one, we have Quantum Break. Now we haven't mentioned this game a lot, so if you missed it, this is a remedy game. But before they really started popping off again with stuff like Alvin Wake 2 and Control, there was Quantum Break, which was technically an Xbox exclusive, released for Xbox One and Windows 10. And it wasn't bad, but people really quickly forgot about it. He plays Jack Joyce, uh, who is the main character played by actor Sean Ashmore, who you may have seen in the X-Men franchise or the other video games, and he's really great here, and Remedy is doing their thing, combining storytelling games here with a video game story, but also a live action scene. They shot up the whole scene of the accessible to the team, but like tied to the events you play, and you watch some show. It was really creative. Uh, I don't know if all the television shows are ended. But the combat here is cool as hell, and it's kind of the super of the most progressive functioning shooting that modern weather games have. You may do a thing or do Quantum Break really pushed the other tag powers here, sitting around the environment, punching and shooting at you, and you're feeling this weird American style of thing. And it was cool as hell. Again, not a game, but some pacing issues and stuff like that. Yeah. If you're looking for something different and you initially missed this one, but you're 
Yeah. Those are 10 games you should have played sooner, or some games, or whatever. If you want to pay attention to some games, that's something. Let us know what you guys think. Anything really wet in your whistle that you think not enough people want to do? Just talk to that in the video. Any suggestions about it? If you like this video and you like talking about it, it really helps us out. So thank you. Thanks for watching. Stopping first person shooter Mega is a great example of how one simple idea can put the clock on its head. In Super Hot, time only moves in an which turns the usually frantic shoot em up experience into a methodical, considered fun. Dodge bullets, grab enemy weapons from midair, and pull up impossible trick shots with supernatural weapons down the The randomized weapon is starting to get into combat profiles, and the reward for completing each game is the full speed of the play of the game, which never fails to make it feel like bad. I had a crisp black, white, and red color scheme, and the result is a game that looks and feels like a futuristic combat training on the Matrix. 49. Limbo. This is the first of two moodily lit, wordless, one-shot, psychological horror puzzle platformers by Danish studio Playdead. Compared to its successor, Limbo puts a bit more emphasis on both puzzles and platforming, but the real selling point is the atmosphere. It begins the same way as Dante's Inferno, with the protagonist sort of randomly showing up and depicts a young boy's harrowing journey through the dark forest, a sinister factory, and other desaturated areas, in an attempt to find his sister or something. The plot and meaning behind most of the in-game imagery is that intentionally vague and Yeah, it seems like there isn't a narrative. Even the filmmaker realized that even narrative is comforting. Along the way, you'll die a few dozen gruesome deaths, which I gotta say really set the mood of this game. Something else I love about Limbo is its life. In my opinion, a lot of games as art tend to overstay their welcome, but Limbo hits the sweet spot somewhere between one and two hours. That means you can play it in one sitting, without ever feeling like you're stuck in actual purgatory. Number 40. Firewatch. I love stories about weird or obscure subjects. I love stories told in unconventional ways. And I love stories with small strokes and personal stories. 
Firewatch checks all of those boxes, and it also looks pretty incredible. It follows the story of a fire lookout called Henry, who spends the summer of 1989 in the Tower. The story is primarily told through walkie talkie conversations with Henry and the Sierra Fire, which are brought to life by experts. A series of experiences that Speaking of which, I love the art of Firewatch so much that it's still the background of the PS4. The game stylized with this game, how it were inspired by Red Dead New Deal era advertising. And the design team even can't be more similar to the game's end of the game. The art of the Firewatch is almost as much as the actual game. Number 47. Stand. On the spectrum of game to experience, Stanley and his parable are pretty firm to The game is basically a matter of It revolves around the relationship between Stanley and Mario and you, what? Stanley is a button pushing office girl who suddenly finds his workplace abandoned and sets out to investigate. His actions are narrated by a disembodied British force that becomes increasingly perturbed by Stanley and Mario. And, of course, controlled by a game. A person sitting in front of the door. The same with Paul Duke's work, but suffice to say, they're full of irony, dry humor, and poor wall building. You do realize there's no choice or anything in here, right? If I'd said Stanley walked past the broom closet, at least you would have had a reason for exploring it to find out. There's even an ultra deluxe version of it, even more self referential And in my opinion, the real genius of it is the way it eventually devolves into the player trying to out. Who have seemingly anticipated every possible thing in the state of Number 46, Hotline Miami. I made another video a while ago where I compared Hotline Miami and Town Zero. So if you want to hear me go into more detail on this one, I'll link that in the description. Ultimately, the book of Hotline Miami is really There's a serviceable film noir plot about the and stuff, but it doesn't matter. This is a fast paced frenetic game without smashing and slashing, with spraying bullets through cords and rushing monsters, while club music comes in the background. It's pretty hard, but every death comes you right back into the game, and the levels are so short that the gameplay loop really sucks. There's also a big variety of weapons to play, from bottles and food cues to katana to music. Hotline Miami feels retro even by game games. Maybe because of the garish neon color scheme, or maybe because of the platform graphics, but it's one of the games on this list that fully deserves classic status. Number 45. C. The first entry on from the year of our 2002. Sifu is a stunningly cinematic roguelike about revenge and the life of the In essence, it's a martial arts game, but some elements that elevate Sifu are striking off the rise, challenging but fair combat, a solid story, and a powerful mechanism. The image of Sifu is the character of the game, only losing vitality, until you eventually succumb to the and your first one. Your character is the son of was betrayed and murdered by a student. And you're something down the line to go to the and eventually the bottom. During each run, you spend XP to unlock permanent points and unlock short runs. But more importantly, you'll perfect your skills as a player in hopes of confronting the final antagonist before you can do If you fully complete the game, there's also a story twist and an alternate ending that might make you think. It's a fresh twist on the roguelike genre, and along the way, Siku never made a chance to I'm a season premier of Operation Nielsen, the Eagle Harbor counterattack. We lost 42 planes and around 200 people. Nobody has found any of the U.S. planes. That's remarkable. Join the extraordinary mission and effort to bring our fallen commanders back home. Number 44, Transistor. The second of three isometric action movies, the Super Giant Game. Transistor tells the story of a voiceless Sifu, a talking sword, and a sultry revenge tour to the dystopian cyberpunk city of the past. You play as Red, a famous singer, Frank Miller, 
and on the run. Bingo. Take that. Which is slowly consuming content in combination with cyber attacks and a massive As in C, you fight your way through the city and systematically take your own. Compared to both its predecessor task and its eventual successor game, Transistor has a much and also leans more into the storytelling aspect, but the isometric combat shares the same thing. Combat feels like the satisfying which is good because most of your time is spent in combat. Although the Transistor Sword is you can customize your play style with like special attacks and limiters, which are optional to the buff that your XP. There's also a tactical element where Red can freeze to plan actions and execute them in your tactical ways and bosses. If you enjoy Bastard, chances are you can also play scripts about them. Oxen. Oxen Creek follows the title where they spend a harrowing night on a dilapidated former tourist trap at Red which is oh, holding to his deep wish. He's a more refugee in secrets. He plays out of the way of the group of people who visit the map. He's a BFF friend. Shy girl known as a friend of me. He dated Alex's girl for the life of the world. He died in a tragic drowning place. What follows is a well-written story. As the teams are separated, talk to the terminal. The part of the series is a natural The way it all plays out is as one of the main features of Oxen Creek is the dynamic real time dialogue trees. The fates and relationships are very far from the best, and your choices also affect how much of the mystery is solved by the end. I really respect the writing of the book in this and Oxen Free sells the story with the war with the quality of the You had Alex bring up a little death machine. Stop saying it was my fault. Come on, Jonas, this is nobody's fault. Ghosts are never anybody's fault, certainly not ours. The other signature element of Oxen Free is most of the puzzles in the game are solved from using various frequencies, and you can pick up additional lore if you need the right way of playing to play the games. More importantly, I like the way the radio is integrated into the backstory and to be a fact of the game. And by the way, Oxen Free is definitely a cool So even if you're easily screwed, you'll probably be able to play this First of all, Basically, a set of inspired patterns picks our little cuts of the deep and static storytelling of the South Korean people. The place is a spirit of battle and battle for the rest of the story to run. Sometime before the story begins, an unknown tragedy is going leaving behind a trail of devastation and survivors. The only lingering genesis of the valley are resentful ghosts and some adorable little creatures who are alive. The rock team up with the best of the past, solve the iron method, some battle anchors, and volcano. I'm not gonna lie, the gameplay of Kidnet is solid. However, have you looked at it? The visual design, the cutscene, the voice acting, the visual design are all good. And they all serve the very sweet and satisfying. Which is the biggest thing. Although, as I said, part of it is a lot of things. So, don't let the video stop. Anyway, kudos to the devs creating an extremely rich and versatile with some really good Number four, Unpacking. Unpacking is a game that was snuck up on. On the surface, there's not much to do. It's really a game about unpacking boxes and really stuff like There are some very light puzzle elements, but if you want an actual brain power, I'd look elsewhere on this list. The real charm of unpacking is the struggle of being able to do As glimpsed through scenes of childhood dead a college dormitory, and essentially you play the part of the attempting to reconstruct the whole scene by handing for artifacts. At the start of each move, I would have to the and what knowledge would be given in the That might sound boring, but trust me when I say it sucks. It helps, maybe, but it's hard to improve it. It makes the act of attacking the sound Many of which I also But I also love unpacking the subject. The moment the the two stages of the and in the next stage, one of the